We're going to continue our discussion of apologetics tonight, a guide to knowing why you believe apologetics 101. We have looked at truth. We looked at truth last week, and if you remember last week, um, I said to you, and I said it from the pulpit during our announcement time this past Sunday here at Abbott's Creek, that truth and morality, which is what we're going to talk about tonight, are tightly connected. They're, they're very much knit together, and much of what I share with you this evening is going to be, in some ways, a review or building on what I shared uh, last Wednesday as it relates to truth, why I believe in truth. Of course, we've looked at why do apologetics at all, what apologetics is, and remember that comes from 1 Peter 3 and verse 15. I want to read that to you again. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense. There's our word. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. So always being prepared to make a defense. That's where we get the word for apologetics. And that's what we're dealing with. Why believe? Someone asks you, why do you believe in truth? Hopefully you'll be able to give them some reasons. Why do you believe in God? Hopefully you'll be able to give them some reasons. And tonight as we talk about morality, morality for me personally is one of the big pointers or clues as to why I personally believe in God and why I think that a strong case can be made for believing in God. So we're going to dive right in as we talk about morality. Why believe in morality? And here's a C.S. Lewis quote to get us started right out the gate. And he says, think of a country where people were admired for running away in battle, or where a man felt proud of double-crossing all the people who had been kindest to him. You might just as well try to imagine a country where two and two made five. And this quote really gets to the heart of what we're going to be sharing tonight. What we're going to try and do is to demonstrate that belief in absolute morality, and I'm going to define all these terms, is reasonable and justifiable. Uh, we're going to deal with right and wrong. Everyone believes in morality, okay? That needs to be said right out the gate. Everyone who is normal, healthy, sane believes in morality. Uh, the question that we're considering is, is whose morality and why I believe in morality and if my view of morality can be, to use a term, quote, imposed on others or is that just something I hold to personally? So everyone would say there is an is, certain things are wrong, it is wrong to do certain things, but the question is why ought I not do certain things or do certain things. And, and that is what we are talking about tonight. So here are the questions. Do you know what is morally right and morally wrong? How do you know what is morally right and morally wrong? Okay. Do you know what is morally right and morally wrong? How do you know what is morally right and morally wrong? I am going to say to you that there is such a thing as absolute morality. What is that? That's something that is binding on all people, at all times, and in all places. And here is a description to kind of get us to understand this even in more detail. Absolute morality is prescriptive of what people ought to do. It's not just descriptive of what they do in fact do. So when we speak about absolute morality, we're talking about something that is prescribed on all people, what they ought to do. They ought to love their neighbor. Okay, that's a positive way. Or you can say they ought not kill, murder. This is prescriptive. It's not just descriptive. We would say, if I say it's wrong, murdering is bad, that's descriptive. But if I say you ought not murder, that's prescriptive. And that's what absolute morality is. Absolute morality is objective, not subjective. It is a moral duty for all people. Think back last week to our discussion of truth. Absolute morality is eternal. It's not temporal. 
It is a moral obligation at all times, regardless of what that particular time period might think. So, for example, let's use an American uh, historical illustration. Was it morally wrong to own people, slavery? Yes, it was morally wrong, although the vast majority of people at one point in time in America thought it was morally right. That didn't change the reality that it was morally wrong. So absolute morality is eternal, not temporal. Absolute morality is universal, not local. It's a moral duty for all places. All right, so it's prescriptive, objective, eternal, and universal. But there might be some objections to absolute morality. And in fact, there are a lot of objections to absolute morality. Again, think back to what I said in our introduction, that everyone is moral. Everyone believes in morality. It's just a matter of whose morality. And if you are right to impose, if you will, your morality on someone else. And there are a whole lot of people, a whole lot of people smarter than me, with a whole lot more power than me, and a whole lot more degrees in education than me, that would say absolute morality is a false thing. It's not true. They object to it on these grounds. They would object to it because they say morality is relative. It's relative. Morality is determined by the individual. Morality is determined by the individual or by society. Morality, another objection would be morality is determined by the culture. And we already alluded to morality is determined by the society. So here's one major objection here at the top. Morality is determined by the individual or society. Last week we talked about the boomerang method. So if someone says, in reference to truth, if someone says to you, there is no such thing as truth, the boomerang method says you ask them the question, is that statement true? That there's no such thing as truth. And if they say, well, yeah, it's true, then obviously there is such a thing as truth. We use that same method. That's the method I was taught, the boomerang method, when it comes to discussions of morality. So the person that says morality is determined by the individual, we apply the boomerang method. And this is something we can do as believers in just general conversations. I remember years ago when I worked at Walmart, I would engage in conversations with people. And oftentimes I would employ the boomerang method. We're trying to get people to see what they actually believe and then hopefully steer them towards Jesus. But you might ask the question for the person that says, there's no such thing as absolute morality because morality is determined by the individual. You might ask this question, which individual, you or the robber breaking in your house? So the robber breaking your house has a morality. You have a morality. Which individual's morality should be imposed right then? All right. Or if someone says morality is determined by the culture, you might ask this question, which culture? The Allies or the Nazis in World War II? Now, I alluded to this last week, and it bears repeating, that many people in societies that do things that we would consider evil do not think they are evil or that they are doing wrong. So if we think to the, the comic book villains, what are they always doing? They're always sitting around a table like this, he, 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 right? They're plotting out evil, okay? And we tend to think in those ways, but the, the reality is that Many people, societies that do what we would call evil things, do not think they're doing evil. They think what they're doing is good, is right. And so we have two uh, separate cultures with two very different views of what's moral, the allies or the Nazis. What about the person that says morality is determined by the society, and since it's determined by the society, it's not absolute? You might ask this question. Which society? The cannibals or the non-cannibals? Question. Which society would you want to live in? The one that thinks it's a morally good thing to eat people? Or the one that thinks it's a morally bad thing to eat people? The answer to that question 
reveals what your position on morality is, that you think morality does go beyond what a society or an individual or a culture thinks. So that, but that is one objection. It, it's this very subjective or individual or cultural objection. And I shared at the end of our uh, study last week how many people will look to other cultures and say, see here, for example, in India, see here, they don't eat cows and we eat cows. Therefore, morality is not absolute. And I alluded to the fact that no, when you understand why they don't eat cows, then you understand that we basically believe the same thing about eating our ancestors. We don't want to do that. That's a moral wrong. And so you just look below and you realize that morality is not determined by the individual, by the culture, or by the society. But what about this second objection that's often leveled against absolute morality? Can we still believe in morality and absolute morality when the challenge is absolute morality is intolerant? Okay? So the popular expression would be this. You have no right to impose your morality on me. All right? And this goes to the, back to the question about whose morality and do I have a right to impose my morality? So they would argue, you don't have any right to impose your morality on me. Use the boomerang method and you might ask the question like this. What do you mean by right... And then, what if you are being mugged? So, if someone is being mugged, would they want me to impose my morality on that situation by rescuing them from the mugger? Or would they want me to step back and say, no, I'm not going to be that intolerant and impose my morality on you and the mugger? I mean, the mugger thinks it's okay. You're on your own. I'm sorry. Of course not. That person, help! All right, so that reveals, you just ask these questions. And, and I've learned in my apologetic studies that asking questions is really key because, you're again, you're trying to draw out what people actually believe. There's a lot of things that make for good uh, tweets on the Twitter or they make for good, I don't know, whatever you call it, on the Facebook, which we're on right now, or they make for good posts on the Instagram or whatever the case may be, or Snapchat or uh I pray not TikTok. I pray not TikTok or any of those social media platforms. But in reality, they don't work out in life. They, they don't have livability, you might say. All right? and, and these objections, they fall apart when you just apply the boomerang method. Okay? Apply the boomerang me method. But, but let's deal with these arguments. And let's talk about the arguments for absolute morality. Okay? absolute morality. Uh, moral relativism is self-defeating, all right? It's self-defeating. The statement, no one knows what is right or wrong, we can reply to that by saying, is it right that no one knows what is right or wrong? Do you see the similarity, the parallels between this and the discussion of truth? Uh, if, if someone says no one knows what is right or wrong, you ask, is it right that no one knows what is right or wrong? If you know it's right that no one knows what is right or wrong, then there's one right thing you know, and now my head hurts. All right? But you apply this boomerang method, and that's what happens. Someone might say, it is impossible. The objection, as we think about arguments for absolute morality, more relativism is self-defeating, and here is how and why it's self-defeating. It is impossible to know what is wrong unless we know what is right. So if you, the illustration that was always given to me, a map. If you take a map that has been drawn by a child with uh, colored pencils, how do you know whether that map is right or wrong? Well, you have to have a correct map to check it by. And so in order to know that that map drawn by the child is wrong, you have to have an accurate map. And so you don't know a line is crooked unless you have a straight line to compare it with. Same thing is true in morality. A another way to answer this would be that it is impossible to measure, that's the next slide, it is impossible to measure moral progress without an absolute standard. People say, we want progress. 
Well, what does it mean to progress? It means to move to a certain point. There's an end game, all right? But if we don't have any idea of what's better or best, how can we say we're, there's progress happening? And, and that's a real question. There is no more progress, progress without an absolute standard. Modern society, here's an example. Modern society is better than the ancient society that treated women as inferior. Okay, on a certain, right. But in order for this statement to be true, there has to be a standard of how we should treat people, whether women or men, that is above society, right? And what did we say back in our earlier slides? That someone might say morality is determined by the society, but then that same person would say modern society is better. Well, that's not fair. You're judging that society's morality. You just told me that societies have the right to determine their own morality. You see how this falls apart? I hope you do. It is impossible to have real moral disagreement without an absolute standard. Again, the Nazis were wrong to kill six million Jews. This is a real moral disagreement. I just finished reading a book in which it talked all about uh, World War II and the Third Reich and the heinous actions. And it spoke a lot about uh, the Nuremberg trials and then those additional trials that happened in Israel to leaders of the SS. And to a man, those SS officers and Nazis said that they were only following orders. They all pled not guilty. And what was the charge against them? It was crimes against humanity. There was this understanding that there was a moral law, a moral standard, and that standard makes it possible for one society, one culture, one individual to make a judgment about another society, another culture, or another individual. But without an absolute standard, this is an impossibility. So here's C.S. Lewis quote again. Uh, C.S. Lewis, the reason I quote him uh, often, not simply because almost everything that he writes is worth reading, but um, his view and the way he wrote about morality is, has been very influential. And here's what he says. My argument against God, he was an atheist for a long time, my argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. But how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? And so he recognized there has to be this standard of justice in order, in order for me to know what is unjust. And this is a classic example. How do you know who's right and who's wrong? Mother Teresa, Adolf Hitler. If it's individual, if it's culture, or if it's society, we're kind of left in the dark. But there's an unchanging moral law, and that's how we're able to judge that Mother Teresa was good and Adolf Hitler was evil because of that standard. Not because of some arbitrary society or culture, but there's a standard, something within the human heart that I'm going to mention here in a few moments. So let's talk about the origins of morality. Where does morality come from? Now, let me say something, and we're going to go through this, these uh, slides rather quickly. When I'm talking about morality, um, I am not saying that an unbeliever, a non-Christian, is immoral or cannot be moral. Never, ever, ever say that. If you're, if you're a believer watching this, Never, ever, ever say that. If you're an unbeliever watching this, I am not saying that you have to be a Christian in order to know what is good and what is bad. I think human beings can know what is good and what is bad by virtue of being human beings. And I'll get to that in a moment. That's not what we're saying. We're not saying you have to be a Christian to know what is good and what is bad, what is right and what is wrong. What I am saying is in order to justify your beliefs about morality, you have to appeal to some standard 
that doesn't collapse. Okay, so the standard of the culture, the standard of society, the standard of the individual, they all seem to collapse when we use the boomerang method. So there has to be a standard that we appeal to to make these moral judgments. All right, so how do individuals who do not believe in God explain morality? And I have several quotes here. The, I have some naturalistic explanations, meaning explanations that are just built into nature. Let's see what they say. One explanation is morality is an illusion. These two gentlemen, Michael Roos and Edward O. Wilson, smarter guys than me, but here's what they say about morality. Morality, or more strictly our belief in morality, and that's what we're talking about here tonight. Why believe in morality? And I'm arguing that morality is a real thing that we can know. And we can live according to the standards of absolute morality. I'm saying it's a real thing. What do they say? Morality, or more strictly our belief in morality, is merely an adaptation put in place to further our reproductive ends. Hence, the basis of ethics does not lie in God's will or in the metaphorical roots of evolution or in any other part of the framework of the universe. In an important sense, Ethics, as we understand it, is an illusion fobbed off on us by our genes to get us to cooperate. Okay? So what the not... And I'm not saying that these gentlemen are saying this, but the conclusion that you would draw from this is what the Nazis did wasn't evil in the sense of being an evil thing, but it was bad because it doesn't help us cooperate. It hurts the survival of the uh, human species. It's just an illusion. What about morality as an adaptive trait of evolution that aids our survival? Mark, Michael Shermer, he says, by a moral sense, I mean a moral feeling or emotion generated by actions. Now, Michael Shermer is an atheist or a skeptic, and therefore he doesn't believe in a soul, and so the moral feelings or emotions, remember what I said a couple weeks ago, are really just chemical reactions in your brain. It's like indigestion. Okay? Eat a taco or pizza or whatever gives you indigestion. Your moral um, reactions to things, when you see evil, that reaction is the equivalent of indigestion. For example, positive emotions such as righteousness and pride are experienced as a psychological feeling of doing good. He puts quotes on good. These moral emotions likely evolved out of behaviors that were reinforced as being good either for the individual or for the group. So it's just a thing that helped our uh, ancestors survive. So that the reason we're around and we hold the certain moral beliefs we do is because the group that held those beliefs survived. Sam Harris, this um, atheist, um, he says this, same idea, same idea of this adaptive uh, trait, that morality is an adaptive trait of naturalistic evolution that aids survival. We must continually remind ourselves that there is a difference between what is natural and what is actually good for us. Cancer is perfectly natural, and yet its eradication is a primary goal of modern medicine. Evolution may have selected Territorial violence, rape, and other patently unethical behaviors as strategies to propagate one's genes, but our collective well-being clearly depends on our opposing such natural tendencies. Basically, what Sam Harris is saying is at one time, territorial violence and rape, although we know they're patently unethical, how he knows that, I don't know, because he doesn't have an absolute standard, were good in the sense that they helped achieve a goal, that the collective survival of the species. This really takes the, the teeth out of morality. A, re, a reduction of morality to purely naturalistic terms removes all ability to declare an action right or wrong in any meaningful sense. All that we are left with is saying that a particular action is beneficial or not beneficial. The thing is, Sam Harris believes there is real, more, he's a moral realist. That means he believes there are actual moral goods and bad. Absolute rights or wrongs. But where does he grab it? So, 
Why should we believe in absolute morality? I think I've demonstrated that to hold to a morality being anything other than absolute is a problem. Morality comes from a transcendent moral lawgiver, the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In the Declaration of Independence, the founders appeal to a transcendent moral lawgiver, something above any particular nation, culture, people, individual, that gave, that gave rights that help determine right and wrong. All right? The moral pointer to the theism. So here it is. We've been talking about this. Laws require lawgivers. There are absolute moral laws. Everyone who is watching this can think of an absolute moral law. It's not that hard. Therefore, there must be an absolute moral lawgiver. Morality can be known apart from the Bible. What do I mean by that? I'm saying that, let me read our other passage, Romans chapter 2 and verses 14 and 15. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. The Gentiles who did not have the Old Testament, the Torah, the law, did the commands of the law because they, being human beings, the law was written on their hearts. And they demonstrated that by recognizing and obeying that law. I'm not going to spend time on that about the youth of dilemma and all those kind of things. But here's what morality is. Morality is not the herd instinct. Morality is not social convention. Morality differs from the laws of nature. Injustice does not disprove morality or the moral law giver. Without an absolute standard, morality disintegrates into confusion. So from this conclusion, what we've said here is that we can come to the solid standard that there is an intuitive ought in human beings. We know this. We know not only that something is wrong or right, but we know we ought to do the right and not the wrong. This intuitive oughtness that we know inside of us, our conscience, as we read in Romans chapter 2, is referred to as the law written on our hearts. And this is a powerful pointer to God. The laws require lawgivers. There is a moral law, therefore there is a moral lawgiver. This is the way human beings are made. We're made to live according to this moral law. And when we deviate from that, that's when we commit immoral acts. Uh, the way that we should live our lives is outside. It's been marked for us by someone else. It's been marked for us by the inventor of the race. And if we don't run that race in a way that reflects the inventor of the race, God, then we are engaging in immoral actions. Yet here is the problem. It all comes down to this. We deny this. Romans chapter 1 verse 18 says... We suppress the truth of God. I hopefully not confuse you all too much. But I think just on its face, it's very obvious that there are certain things that are wrong and there are certain things that are right. And regardless of whether someone believes in God or not, we know that inside. But yet people suppress and they try and come up with all sorts of crazy explanations for this moral law written on their heart rather than acknowledging a good moral law giver. Why? Why? We deny the moral law to our own harm. We deny that the actions we engage in are harmful, although we can look around society and see what happens when we go against the moral law written on our hearts. Why do we deny this? Why do Christians deny it whenever we engage in sin? Why do unbelievers reject, say, I don't want that? Well, I think the problem is more often has to do with the will than with the head. What do I mean by that? I can give you quote of quote of atheist writers throughout 
the decades and the centuries who said they did not want there to be a God because he would interfere with the way they wanted to live their lives. We don't want there to be an absolute moral law. We don't want there to be an absolute moral law because we don't want there to be a lawgiver. Because if there is a lawgiver, then every single human being is accountable to that lawgiver. And the Bible clearly communicates that. Now, here's the thing. We are all lawbreakers. And that's why Jesus came. Jesus came to fulfill God's absolute moral law for us and then to die for us lawbreakers so that we could be made right with the moral lawgiver. And it's my prayer that everyone who views this either right now, live, or later on, knows the moral lawgiver as your heavenly father because you put your trust in Jesus Christ, the one who fulfilled God's law for you. And then for the Christian tonight as I close, I hope you will uh, take the opportunity to use what we're talking about, these studies, to engage in conversation with individuals. Use the boomerang method. If you have any questions, of course, reach out to us here on Facebook. I, I love to engage in question and answer, and uh, that would be a real encouragement to me. And, uh, of course, if we can do anything for you uh, in any way, please let us know. It's a, my joy to share with you tonight. I love this stuff, and I appreciate you that have uh, tuned in faithfully each week. And we look forward to seeing you on Sunday. God bless.